Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to be thinking about how to write a rising sequence over a bass line that's kind of using the circle of fifths as a pitch outline but is also a sequence using four, three, suspension. So we've got a couple of ingredients here. Now, first thing is, if you're not at all sure what the circle of fifths is, let me refer you to um, our video on that very topic. So if the circle of fifths is a totally new concept, I just advise you to have a look at that video first. Pause this one, have a look at that, come back to this once you've got a grip on the circle of fifths. But essentially, the circle of fifths is telling us about major and minor keys. We start with C major with no sharps, no flats. We go up a fifth to G, G major's got one sharp, up a fifth to D, D major's got two sharps, up a fifth to A, A major's got three sharps, up a fifth to E, E major's got four sharps, and so on. Or we can go down in fifths. So if we go C down a fifth, we get to F major, that's got one flat. That flat happens to be B flat. So when we go down another fifth, we go to B flat. So B, ma B flat major's got two flats. That's new flat is E flat. So go down another fifth to E flat. E flat major's got three flats. Down another fifth to A flat. A flat major's got four flats and so on. So the circle of fifths is essentially telling us about those keys. That video will explain all the detail of it. What I'm talking about here is how we might use the outline pattern of the circle of fifths to generate a baseline. So if you have a look at you know, this baseline in relation to what I've just explained, I've said that if you go up from C a fifth, you get to G. Well, you might look at this and say, well, you haven't gone up a fifth, you've gone down a fourth. It's the same thing, actually. If I go up a fifth from C, I get to G. So this is G, is just in a lower octave. So by going down a fourth, up a fifth, down a fourth, up a fifth, I kind of keep this bass line contained. C, down a fourth, up a fifth, down a fourth, up a fifth, and so on. It just means that I don't go C, G, D, A, E, B, and go flying up the keyboard in no time at all, because the bass line won't cope with that. You couldn't sing a line that did that. If you played a bass instrument, you'd soon run out of notes. If you play the keyboard, you'd run out of notes on the keyboard. So by doing this thing where we're sort of going up in fifths, but we're containing it by going down, a fourth, up a fifth, down a fourth, up a fifth. It kind of makes it all manageable and it makes much more sense of the baseline. So that's where the baseline is coming from. Now, what about the other ingredient when I'm talking about suspensions? Again, we've got videos out there telling you about suspensions. So you may want to have a look at those if the idea of a suspension is new to you. But essentially, in a suspension, you prepare, you sound, you resolve. So P is a note that belongs to the first of two chords. R is a note that belongs to the second of two chords. And S is a note that you're just holding on to either by sustaining it or repeating it because it's P repeated even though S is going to clash with the second chord. So the first chord comes here, the second chord comes there, but you can see how P belongs to the first chord, R belongs to the second chord, but S is just holding on to that P note. It's just delaying it moving on to the R note. So it gives you a little bit of dissonance. So if I talk about a 4-3 suspension, well, I might be doing something like this. If I have this in a melody, that uh, is the treble clef. And then maybe in the bass clef, I'm doing something like this. You can see that what I'm doing here is this is P, this is S, this is R. This P belongs to this chord. It probably is a chord four in first inversion. This E belongs to this C, so that's probably a chord one in root position. But you can see how this S is a dissonance. It doesn't belong to chord one, but P and S are the same note. S resolves to R by step normally downwards. So that's what I mean by a 
4-3 suspension. And I call that a 4-3 suspension because when I go S to R, S is a fourth above the base, R is a third above the base. You can have other suspensions, 7-6 suspensions, 9-8 suspensions, but that's a brief summary of what a 4-3 suspension is. So to really grasp this, sort of understanding that pattern that comes from the circular fifth, that's going to be our baseline, and then understanding how a 4-3 suspension works, so you can tuck that into the upper parts. Now, before we go any further, I'm just going to play this first version of what I'm talking about. Let's have the sound of it. Okay, so you can hear it's a sequence. It's the same idea, kind of repeating in each bar, each measure, but it's rising. So that's why it's called a rising sequence, the same pattern of notes. Um, but when you look at all the notes in this bar, for example, well, they're all one higher than the notes in this bar. So it goes on. OK, so there's my bass going up in fifths, or in this case, down a fourth, up a fifth, down a fourth, and so on. So we're doing all this. And I, this could be F natural and C natural, but just for variety, I thought, let's introduce an F sharp there and a C sharp there. It shows you that you could write this all in one key, or you could introduce sharps or flats to change to a different key. And what's going on here is at this point, this is a 4-3 suspension. Now, can you see this G is prepared, sounded, resolved. S to R is going 4 to 3. So P belongs to the chord at the end of the first bar, the first measure. R belongs to the chord on the second beat of the second bar, the second measure. S is a dissonance with that second chord, but it's the same note as P and it resolves to R by step. So there's a 4-3. I've got a 4-3 in the same part here. I've got a 4-3 in the same part here. But at the same time, I've also got a 4-3 going on here. Now, just because that first note is a two-beat note and it's not repeated or something, it doesn't really matter. It could be a re repetition or it could be a sustained note. But that is going 4, 3 above this bass note. So it's prepared here, belonging to this chord. It's sounded here. It's resolved here. So I've got a 4, 3 there, a 4, 3 there, a 4, 3 there, a 4, 3 there. So you see what we're doing? We're alternating 4, 3 between these upper parts, which makes it much more interesting than just kind of going... If I just put chords down, it'd be a bit boring. So these 4-3 suspensions will be imposed on this uh, rising sequence in the bass, based on the circle of fifths, and make it all sound quite interesting. So hear that again. Now, you can decorate that, of course. things like that. You can decorate in both the parts. That's fine. You can have the bass decorating, you know. You can do a combination of things. You can make it more exciting, in other words. But you see how this works? We're working the bass line around the circle of fists. I'm kind of going to the right of the circle of fists to help give me this rising sequence. I could go to the left, do it the other way. But that's how you generate the rising sequence based on the circle of fifths. And then this is how you write these 4-3 suspensions. And what I've tried to do there, as you can see, is to generate 4-3 suspensions alternating in the upper two parts all the way through. Now, I could do exactly the same thing, but in the second version, I'm just using different accidentals. So it's exactly the same thing as I've done before. You've got exactly the same rising sequence in the bass. You've got exactly the same 4-3 suspensions. But this time, I'm kind of throwing lots of flats at it so we can explore 
um, a bit more of a range of keys. And instead of starting in C major, I'm starting on a C minor chord. Have a listen to this. So you see how I'm just using the accidentals to kind of just modify the exactly the same plan. I'm using all of the same notes effectively, aren't I? The same letter names, but I'm just applying different accidentals to them. That C minor chord, and then it goes to a G minor chord. Then I'm going to a D flat major chord, and then to an A flat major chord, then to an E flat major chord, then to a B flat minor chord, then to an F minor chord, then to a C minor chord. So this one's much more mobile than the first one. The first one starts in C major and then, well, it introduces an F sharp and we kind of wander off from there a little bit. This one is much more mobile because we're introducing more accidentals from an earlier stage. So you can use this kind of sequence to stay in one key or you can use it to transition between one key and another, or you can use it to explore a whole range of different keys. So if you're a performer, you might notice that in some of the music you're playing that you get these sequences, especially in Baroque music, but often in music beyond the Baroque. If you're a composer and you're thinking, you know, I've got some great ideas going here, now, what do I do with them? How do I develop them? How do I kind of build a little bit of tension? How do I write a link between one place and another? How do I use a sequence to get from one key to another? You see how this stuff can be really useful to you. And it doesn't really matter which style you're writing in, you can adapt this to purpose uh, and make it fit whatever it is that you, you want to write. So it's a really useful kind of sort of technical thing to understand. So if you're playing, you know you can paint the sequence in the way you play. You know, you might have a crescendo going through that rising sequence, for example. It might be something you could do. You might want to draw out these four, three suspensions bouncing between two parts and enjoy that conversation. If you're writing it, well, it's just showing you how you can think about writing a rising sequence or how you can think about using four, three suspensions or even how you can combine the two things. So I hope that's a useful video that's just adding a little bit of useful know-how, bit of technique uh, into your toolkit for being a performing musician or for being a composer. Well, if you've enjoyed this video, let me invite you to have a little tour of the Music Matters website www.mmcourses.co.uk. Lots of courses out there. Um, if you're really wanting to kind of zap up on this kind of harmonic understanding, well, have a look at our advanced theory course. That's kind of assuming you know the nuts and bolts of music theory, but maybe now you want to go a step further, understand more about the kind of things that we've been talking about in this video, understand the context of that using figured bass, Baroque style, writing a bit of counterpoint, improving your harmonic knowledge, writing stuff for piano, writing good strong melodies, melodies that belong to what's happening in the accompaniment and the harmony, empowering yourself with analytical skills uh, so that you can look at a piece of music and understand what's going on and therefore empowering you further as a composer. So if that course sounds like something that would be of interest to you, well, it would flow on from today's topic very nicely. Lots of other stuff to look at there as well. www.mmcourses.co.uk